I was actually looking forward to the children's story. <laughs> yeah, I, so I, I sat down quickly. I was like, no, 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 let's take care of our children. I guess today we don't have our children's story, so to all of our precious children, please forgive us. We will have that for you the next time by God's grace. Well, let me go ahead and say happy Sabbath to everyone again. All right. I am very, very privileged to be here with you all. Um, I can't put into words how thankful I am for the Word of God. I have found a very different experience than what is known. You know, people say that religion makes you mad. Uh, some people believe that religion drives you crazy and things of that nature. And I would imagine a fanatical position of religion could do that. Um, you know, but true biblical religion, it, it keeps you very, very sane in a very insane world and in an insane time. And I'm, I marvel at how much the word of God can bring wisdom, counsel, instruction, and even comfort to us in trying times. And so at this time, I am going to be continuing in our study. We've been going throughout the past several weeks, going over the great purpose of the church. I am thoroughly convinced that we are living in a time that we need to understand the purpose of church from God's perspective. We need to revisit once again what the word of God says on what is church, how does it work, what is its great purpose. And so I'm going to be covering some things here that are, I would imagine, it, it's going to be reminders, it's going to be enlightening, and maybe even challenging. So I want us to be very prayerful about what we're going to be studying during this time. So let's go ahead and let's begin with one more word of prayer. I'm going to go to my knees to do that. If you want, you're welcome to join me in kneeling. Otherwise, bow your heads and let's prepare our hearts to receive the word. And I want to say this. Take notes. Take notes. Take pictures. Write things down. Consider what we are reading. And I want you to go back and I want you to investigate the scripture and make sure everything that was said on the pulpit is indeed a thus saith the Lord. And so as we prepare our hearts to receive the word, let's go to our knees and let's have a word of prayer. And if you, again, if you can't kneel, just bow your heads. But let's ask the Lord to do something special during this time. Father, we, we avail ourselves once again because today's message has a place of, of a startling impact to some. And I pray that you might temper it with the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray, Lord, that you will make your words plain to our hearts and help us to realize what you are saying to your people in such a time as like this in Earth's history. Make your words plain to us, I pray, and give us wisdom that exceeds our years, for we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Once again, let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Let me just grab my clicker. All right. I want us to turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 24. I want to go over something here first that will prepare our minds for the study we're going to do today. We're going to the book of Matthew. We're going to consider chapter 24 because we're going to take somewhat of a look of the prophetic picture of the church. We're going to take a look at the prophetic picture of what God wants to do with the church. And so let's prepare our hearts for this. Please let me know when we're good on the screen to get the slides up. We're in Matthew 24. All right. In Matthew, the 24th chapter, you have to understand that Jesus just left the temple. And he left the temple not in a he left in a very bad way. Christ was weeping because he wanted to give the people of the church of his day heaven's choicest blessings. But instead, they rejected him. And in their rejection of him, Jesus began to weep and he began to uh, statements in Matthew 23. But then when you get to Matthew 24, as the disciples are seeing Jesus walk away, let's notice what the Bible says. Matthew 24, here please say amen. amen. All right. In Matthew 24, starting at verse 1, here's what the Bible says. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. The disciples were very much caught into adoration. They were very much adoring the temple because in their minds, just simply being a part of the temple was salvation. 
This was a great, great mistake of the days of Christ. It's the great, great mistake of the days of God's people now. There's sometimes this thought that the more that we are in the church and affiliated with the church, that that equals salvation. This is a falsity. This is not true. The Bible says that there was a time a man was born blind. And when he was born blind, Jesus healed him. And when Jesus healed him, it was so miraculous and so profound, proving who Christ was, that the Pharisees were enraged and the Pharisees began to get the blind man's parents involved. And the Bible says in John chapter 10 that, or John chapter 9, that, you know, the Pharisees said, your son, was he born blind? Yes. They said, well, how do you explain that he could see? And the Bible says they said a very smart answer. They said, he's a grown man. Let him ask for himself. Ask him. Now, while that was a very mature statement, thankfully, the Bible really shows the heart of where the parents were. For the scripture goes on to say that the parents were afraid to confess Christ because they were fearful they would be put out of the synagogue. Now, brothers and sisters, either stay in the temple or stand for Jesus, I don't know what choice you're going to make. I've already made up mine. I'm going to stand for Jesus. And so it is that, unfortunately, this mindset that was in the days of Christ is still a mindset of many of God's people today. Don't do anything that will make people in the temple upset. Because if we do that, then we lose not only favor with the people, but the false teaching of that day was we lose salvation itself. Now, the disciples were caught up in adoring the temple. And so what Jesus did is he took their minds away from adoration and brought their minds to inspiration. This is how the chain was broken. And that's why when they said, look at the building of the temple, Jesus said, you see all these things? In a little while, there will not be one stone left upon another that shall not be torn down. It shook the disciples up so much that it prompted in verse 3. So look at verse 3. The Bible says in Matthew 24, now verse 3, it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So now Jesus has the disciples where he wants them. Now they're more focused on inspiration and not temporary adoration. This is exactly where Christ wanted them. Now he can teach them. And so Jesus starts by saying, let no man deceive you. And he begins to walk them through a series of events. Now, here's the point I want to really get to so that we can appreciate this study. OK, this is the point. This is the this is a two part to this particular study, because all of it can't be covered in one study temperately. So watch this. After Jesus says that, let's go down now and let's look at verses. Yeah, we'll go ahead. And at verse 5 and take it down to verse 8. I want you to watch it very carefully. It says in verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And then he says, All of these are the beginning of of birth pains, sorrows. The word sorrows in the Greek means birth pains. Now, I want you to watch this. This is the point that I want us to get. If you get this, you will be able to appreciate the rest of the study. If you don't get this, you will not be able to appreciate the rest of the study. Everything that Jesus said, or the great deal of things that Christ said, after verse 8, explaining, he's answering the question. Remember, the disciples had a twofold question. When are these things going to happen? What shall be the sign of your coming? Okay, they wanted to know two things. When are these things going to happen? What shall be the sign of your coming? Now, Christ gave an example, nation rising against nation and all these other things. There was a part of Jesus' explanation that was going to be fulfilled in the generation that he spoke to. Are you following that? There was a part of Jesus' explanation 
that was going to actually be fulfilled in the generation that he actually was speaking to. But there was also a part of Jesus' explanation that was going to go way down into the future of the people of God right before his second coming. Jesus is going to be fulfilled in the very generation that he was talking to. to be fulfilled before the second coming. If you understand what I'm saying those, thus far, let me hear you say amen. amen. All right, now, this is what we call dual prophecy. Dual, meaning two. Dual, meaning it's going to have a fulfillment on a smaller scale at one point, and then it's going to have another fulfillment on a larger scale at a second point. Are you following that? The Bible is actually filled with dual prophecies. When you think of that prophecy in Malachi chapter 4, when the Bible talks about when Elijah was going to come and he shall unite the hearts of the fathers with the children and the children with the fathers, the first application of that was during the days of John the Baptist. But then there's a last day application of that that will take place amongst the people of God right before the end of time. And that's why family is so important, Sister Detra. That's exactly why we can never stop praying for our children, because we're living in the time where the hearts of the children need to be more united with the parents, and the hearts of the parents need to be more united with the children, because there must be a last day fulfillment of that Elijah message. But the Bible is filled with this thought of dual prophecies, of partial fulfillment on one side, a larger fulfillment on the other side. Again, if you understand what I'm saying thus far, let me hear you say amen again. Amen. All right, now, I think we can appreciate the rest of the study. Let's do a summary from what we've been covering thus far. We've covered three principles as we look at the great purpose of God's church, the great purpose of God's church. We looked at three principles thus far. The first thing we studied was the great purpose of God's church is what? Evangelism. Family. The church is not a social club. The church is not a family affair. If you want to have family gatherings, open up your house whatever days of the week you choose, and that's when you can get together with family. If you want to join a country club or a social club, I'm sure there's plenty around here, especially on the wealthier sides of Northern California. But the church is not raised up, has never been raised up, just so we can absolutely enjoy just seeing each other. The church was raised up for the purpose of evangelism. In fact, in inspiration, evangelism is referred to as the breath or the life of the church. So if you want to know what a dead church looks like, look to a church that's not doing evangelism. That is a dead church, no matter how much it looks alive. It's dying or it's dead. And so the great purpose of the church is evangelism, making known the righteousness of God and his law to a sinful world. That was our first study. Our first study on the great purpose of the church is evangelism. We must always be an evangelistic church. Oh, and let me say this. There's only one evangelism in the Bible. You want to know what it is? There's only one evangelism in the Bible. Go to Revelation 14. Let me show you. Go to Revelation 14, 6. There's only one evangelism in the Bible. There's only one biblical evangelism. Any other evangelism is a counterfeit. Any other evangelism is false. Any other evangelism is man-made. In Revelation 14, there's only one kind of evangelism. And the Bible spells it out so clear, I just don't understand how anyone could miss it. In Revelation 14, notice what the Bible says in verse 6. If you're there, say amen. amen. The only evangelism. The Bible says in Revelation 14, 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell where? On the earth to 
every what? Nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Are you following, saints? That's the only evangelism that heaven endorses, is the evangelism that reaches out equally and fairly to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and every people. Do you know the Jews got to a point that they wanted the church to largely be their nation? Did you know that? And do you know some of the greatest rebukes came to the Jewish nation because their focus was more on their nation than all the other nations that were clearly surrounding them? And that's why eventually probation closed on the Jewish nation. No, did you hear that? Probation closed on the Jewish nation because they refused to fulfill the purpose of the church. And they were too busy focusing on what they wanted to do with the church. Well, here it is that the Bible is very clear. So every nation, kindred, tongue, and people is the evangelistic work that God has called us to do. Now watch. The second study we did was we must understand for ourselves the character of God so that we can give a right representation of him to the people. In that second study that we did, we really wanted to investigate who's the God that you accepted? Who's the God that I accepted? Who is he? Do we really know who he is? Because we realize that the picture of God that we have in our minds is the God that we're going to express to other people. And if we have a wrong concept of God and his character, we will do a wrong evangelistic effort in reaching the people, and we will present to the people our idolatry. You see, idolatry is creating an image of God in our mind and worshiping that God versus the true and living God. There is not an idol that is constructed, whether it looks like a fish, a calf, or a goat, or anything else. There's not an idol that has been constructed and carved that did not start in the imagination. And so idolatry is not necessarily just the bowing down before a physical image. It could bow down before a conceptual image that we erected in our minds. And so our second study, we wanted to make sure, do we have a right understanding of the true character of God? Because once we have that, then we can do effective work in sharing Christ with those who know him not. Third, last week we studied, in order for us to faithfully execute this work, order and organization is essential. God has a blueprint of how to most effectively proclaim his good news. To have success, we should follow it. No, we must follow it if we're going to have success. We cannot follow it, but we won't have the success. But if we want to have the success, we need to follow God's blueprint. We need to follow the order and organization of how he set the church to work. Now, after doing all these studies, let's revisit once again. You'll remember in Matthew 16, Jesus talked about the church. The word, the word church comes up for the first time in the Bible in Matthew 16. And I want us to turn there. Let's go to Matthew 16, and let's see what the Bible says in verse 18. Matthew 16, and we're looking at verse 18. This is the first time in the Bible the word church comes up. Matthew 16, and we're considering verse 18. In Matthew, the 16th chapter, when you get there, please say Amen. Jesus starts a dialogue with his disciples. He says, well, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And he begins going down the list. And uh, they talk about, well, some say this and some say that. But Christ, being the wise teacher that he is and was, he said, well, who do you say that I am? Because that's really what counts. It's not what you know what other people say. What do you say? And so it is that Peter confessed Christ. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And look at what Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my what? I will build my church. So this is the first time the word church comes up in all the Bible. First time is right here in Matthew 16 and verse 18. Now, that word church is called ecclesia. And we have learned that the church, the ecclesia, are the people who were called out, they were the called out ones, a calling out. So whenever you think of the church, you're thinking about a group of people that have been what? 
called out, okay? Now, when we want to understand called out of what, we go again to 1 Peter 2. Let's go back there. We've reviewed this week after week, and we need to review it again because repetition deepens the impression. So now we're in 1 Peter. We're looking at chapter 2, and I want you to see what the Bible says. We are very much still on appetizer phase of this message. The meat is coming. In 1 Peter 2, I want you to see what the Bible says in verse 9. Stick with me, beloved. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, I want you to watch what the text says. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, the Bible says, but you are a what? Chosen generation. What else? A royal priesthood. What else? A holy nation. And what else? A peculiar people. Now notice, it says a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, darkness in super simple terms. Darkness is the absence of light. Would we agree with that? Again, just keeping it super hyper simple. Darkness is the absence of light. Okay? Now watch this. God says, my church are a group of people that I've called out of darkness and obviously called into light. Now, let's go ahead and let's talk about that for a second. When we think about what the Bible calls light, because this is all speaking in spiritual languages, God is not literally calling us out of a dark room into a room where it's illuminated. We know that. God is talking in a spiritual sense, out of darkness, spiritually speaking, into his marvelous light, spiritually speaking. So spiritually, what is light? Three things. Number one, Psalm 119, 105. Let's look at each of these. What does the Bible call light? This is what the church has been called into, okay? Out of the absence of light, into his marvelous light. So let's go ahead and look at Psalm 119, verse 105. We're talking about what is light. There are three things we're going to review that the Bible calls light. Psalm 119, 105. In Psalm 119 and verse 105, if you're there, please say amen. amen. All right. In Psalm 119, verse 105, the Bible says, Thy word is a what? Lamp unto my feet and a what else? Light unto my path. So according to the scripture, what is light when we're spiritually giving a spiritual context to it? What is light? It's the word of God. OK, it's the word of God. So darkness is living a lifestyle not in harmony with the word of God, not knowing what the word of God is. Walking in the light is now living a lifestyle that knows the word of God and is in harmony with the word of God. So. How are we doing with that? Are the decision family? It is the love of sin and it is the love of self that disturbs our peace. Real talk, family. It is the love of sin and it is the love of self that absolutely disturbs our peace. It is when we rise above what the word of God has said. And we get wrapped up into self and how we feel and what we're thinking. And I know my attitude is right and I know they're wrong and I'm right. And we go through all this battling and God somehow stays way back in the back burner. His words are closed. You know, it's funny. I, I, and I know this sister meant well. I know she meant well. There was me and a friend talking. And at one point we were talking about problems in the church. And as we were talking about problems in the church, I said, if only we could do things according to the word of God, so many problems would be solved. And then here's what, I, I know she said it innocently. That's not even a concern for me. But I, I, I'm using this illustration to make a very important point. You know what she said next? She said, yeah, you're right. She says, but Brother Lemon, let's put the Bible aside. I said, stop right there. I said, that's exactly why we're in the trouble we're in. I said, that very phrase that you just said, I said, there is no solving of problems when you put the word of God aside. Amen. And that's the problem, is we have become a society. And to a large degree, we have become a church environment that we put the word of God aside. 
then we still try to solve problems. And the devil just sits back, and I, I, I think we have become his Netflix. I think we have become Satan's Hulu. It's like, he's like, these people are very entertaining. They're following my principles, but trying to fight my kingdom. Listen carefully to what I'm saying to you, beloved. I'm tell we still on appetite. We didn't get to the meat yet. The devil is literally laughing at the great grand majority of God's people because he's saying, you're, you're trying to fight me, but you're using my principles. You're putting the word of God aside and you have the audacity to exalt what you think. And the Bible is ever so clear. This is why our marriages are in terrible condition. This is why our family relationships are in trying situations. This is why even in the church, there's so much drama because we say, put the word of God aside, but let's still try to solve this problem. And we don't understand. Jesus was many things, family, I promise you. He was many things, but he was not a comedian. You know what comedians do for a living? They tell jokes. Christ was not joking when he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds. He was trying to say, this is the formula for a happy life. That's literally what he was trying to do. He said, this is the formula for a happy life right here. Live by every word. Because you're going to have feelings that one day are going to not want to do my word. That's when I need you to choose because I made you bigger than monkeys. I made that. That's why I know evolution is false, because we're smarter than monkeys. We can choose to do things against our nature. A monkey can't. A monkey cannot help but to do what its nature tells it to do. But when you and I are born again and recipients of the Holy Spirit, we can make choices to go against the cries and the woos of our own natures. This is the gospel. And so the first thing God says is, I gave to my church my word. Now, what else is light? Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. Let's go to Proverbs, the sixth chapter. What else is light? Proverbs, we're now going to the sixth chapter. What else does the Bible call light? First thing that God calls light is he says is my word. Now, let's go ahead and let's look at this. Proverbs chapter 6. And now we're going to consider verse 23. In Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23, now let's notice what else God says is light. So the church are a group of people who have been called out of darkness, absence of his word, into his marvelous light. Now we're in his word and we're living by his word and we're operating by his word. But it's not only that. Proverbs 6 and verse 23. The Bible says in Proverbs 6 and verse 23, for the commandment is a lamp and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. God says, the second thing that is light is my law, my commandments. God says, this is the great emphasis that I want my people to give. When they go through the word, I want them to see my law throughout the word. And I want them to see that all of my commandments are righteousness. And this is what I want my people to live by and live in harmony with. There's no decisions we make. That is not only according to his word, but must be in harmony with his law. I remember going to a church. They were a Sabbath-keeping church. And I remember that I re after church, everybody was hungry. And so they wanted to go ahead and go to the store and buy some food. Some of us said, hey, hey, uh, it's the Sabbath day. We don't do this. They said, oh, no, 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 it's all right. We don't have any manservants or maidservants. We're just going and getting it ourselves. It's all right to buy on the Sabbath day. The Bible did not profusely prohibited. And I was like, are you serious? And so I remember going in and I looked at the book of Nehemiah, chapter 13, verses 15 through 18. And when I went to Nehemiah, chapter 13, verses 15 through 18, the Bible says that it was a profanation of the gospel for individuals to buy and sell on the Sabbath day. And I began to bring that back to the precious saints. I said, hey, we need to look at this. God says we shouldn't be doing this. We should not have restaurants that are open. If you own a restaurant, our restaurants are closed on the Sabbath day. We do not buy and we do not sell on the Sabbath day. God says we are supposed to do all that we can to make sure that we're called out of lawlessness into harmony with his law. 
Now we keep his commandments. That includes honor your father and your mother, even if you're over 18. Jesus was 33 years old, 33 and a half to be exact, and he was hanging on a cross. And when Jesus looked at his mother, he still felt a responsibility as a young adult to do that which was honorable in his mother's sight and in his father's sight. And Jesus looked at John and he said, John, behold your mother, take care of my mother because now she's your mother. Jesus still honored his mother. You see, even when we become adults, we must not think it a license to walk away from God's law and now do what we want. Go to Galatians chapter five. What does God say to every 18 year old? Because I know some young people are counting. Some of our young brothers and sisters, they're counting. They're like, man, I can't wait. Once I'm 18, I'm going to do whatever I want, how I want, when I want. And I'm going to do it with God's blessings because now I'm a man. And that's what they think. But look at what Galatians 5 says. It's amazing how the word of God balances our thinking. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, look at what the text says. You know, yes, when you're older, you have freedom. It is so true. And I taught this in my Sabbath school last week, that freedom is something that you're going to get when you are 18 to a certain degree. But let us remember what God wants us to do with that inheritance of freedom. Galatians 5, it was in verse 13 that the Bible says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, freedom. But look at what it says next. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. God says, when you get liberty, don't use it to now start doing whatever you want. Christians, and this isn't good whether you're a child of some, well, everybody's a child of somebody. But family, none of us are free to do what we want. None of us. We are all children of God. None of us are free to do what we want. We are to use our liberties, but not to just fulfill whatever my heart desires. We are to use our liberties to see how can I better serve my mom and dad. You, need, you know, once upon a time in serving our children, it was a little bit of stress on my wife and I. But now when our children get older, they should be thinking, how can we help relieve the stress of mom and dad? You understand? That, that's part of responsible 18-year-olds is, how, you know, now that I got choices and power, I want to use this to see how much I can be a blessing to them as they have been a blessing to me. That's how you use your freedom. You are still called to honor your father and your mother. Yes, it might shape shift to a degree. Granted, mom and dad are not going to tell you to do every little thing. And I get it. And that's a growing part for us parents. Amen. Amen. I'll say it a little louder, parents. Amen. Amen. There's a side to this that we have to realize we got to be hands off. There's a side we have to recognize when our children are of this legal adult age that we can say, okay, you now have ABC responsibilities. Now I want you to go ahead and make good choices. And sometimes they're going to make some not so good choices. And father mode and mama bear mode is going to want to kick in. And sometimes we have to be prepared to let our children make some mistakes and then be there ready in catch mode when they may fall so we can catch them and say, all right, you doing all right? Okay, how can we make sure that that fall doesn't happen again? Did you know there's a little statement in inspiration that says God orders some of us to make small mistakes to protect us from making larger ones. Now, if our father allows us to make certain mistakes in good godly parenting, we need to not be so mama bear, papa bear with our children when they arrive at legal age that we cannot let them make some choices and then they can make some mistakes and we're prepared to be there to help them out in those mistakes and learn from them. God wants us to understand the church has been called out of darkness into his light. Now, so far we know that the light is none other than God's word. We know that the light is none other than God's law. But how do you live it? How do you live in harmony with God's word and law? And how do you do it in a balanced way? Let me show you John 9. In John 9 now, let's notice the last verse we're going to review on this subject of light. In John 9, the Bible shows us one more ray of light. I told you we're going to go over three and we only covered two. 
So let's look at the third one, John 9. In John, the ninth chapter now, we're now going to look at the third demonstration of light because, again, we're called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Thus far, we know the light is his word, the light is his law, and the light is one more thing. What does living in harmony with God's word and law look like on a daily practical life? John 9, verse 5. The Bible says in John 9 and verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You see, Jesus is the light. Jesus says, listen, what I'm calling people to is I'm calling them out of darkness and absence of Christ likeness. And I'm calling them into my marvelous light, which is now living a life that reflects Christ likeness as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as an employee, as a church member, as an individual. God says, I've called you out of darkness into my marvelous light. And Jesus says, this is what I want you to light the earth up with. Jesus says, I want you to show the earth Christ likeness. Show them what it is to live a life in harmony with the word and the law in a balanced way. That's what Jesus did when he walked on this earth. Christ says, this is what I raised up the church to be. This is what I raised the church to do. And we are to do it in an orderly and organized fashion is to make Christ known, but with this calling, the Bible also says something else, and it's a solemn one, and this is where our study is going to begin transitioning. The calling is very, very clear. The church makes up a group of called out ones, people who are called out of darkness. They're called into God's marvelous light. That light is his word, his law, and the balance of Christ-like living. This is what is to be demonstrated. But there's somebody who wants to make sure there's no way that this is going to happen. And the Bible spells it out in Revelation chapter 12. Turn there with me. In Revelation chapter 12, there is a being that determined to make sure that this will not be fulfilled. The Bible says in Revelation 12 and verse 17, in Revelation, the 12th chapter and the 17th verse, the Bible says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church, but it does infer that the gates of hell is going to attack the church. Satan is not going to make this journey easy for any of us. The reality is, is that the devil is determined to fight with everything he has to make sure that we do not properly reflect that light. He is determined to make sure that we do not properly reflect that light. And so I'd love to say that all we got to do is leave this sanctuary and say, OK, today I choose to let light shine in my life. I'm going to live according to the word. I'm going to keep God's law and I'm going to give a beautiful, balanced presentation of Christ like Ness. Here we go. It would be lovely if we could just have a cakewalk with this and just go tell all of our communities and everybody around the story of the lovely Jesus, the light of the world. But there's no way that Satan's going to make this job easy. The devil has decided to attack. And he's been attacking God's people from times past. And you better believe he's going to attack God's people in these very last moments in Earth's history. And this is why we are now transitioning to a phase of our study that I think we need to pay very close attention to what the Word of God says. You see, the Bible reminds us that history repeats itself. The Bible says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done, it is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. History has a tendency to repeat itself. 
And while God raised up the church to do an incredible work, and I am thankful that I've already read the end of the story and I found out the lamb wins. So I'm not worried about how the story ends. But what I've realized is that I'm a part of this drama. And you and I need to realize that you're part of this drama. And you can either be on the side of positive fulfillment or you can be on the side of negative fulfillment. I want to show you something that Jesus showed his disciples, and I thought the timing was very interesting. Go to Matthew 10. I thought this timing was so interesting when Christ did this. In Matthew, the 10th chapter, Jesus did something. You got to keep in mind that in Matthew 10, this is the beginning of the ministry between Christ and his disciples affecting the world. And in Matthew chapter 10, I thought it was so interesting what Christ brought up so early in his walk with the disciples. The Bible says in the book of Matthew chapter 10, and we're starting at verse 1, and we're going to take it from verses 1 to 5. Take a look at this. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 1 to 5, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirit to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Libius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon of the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. Now, he begins to send them out. But as he's giving them instruction in ministry, and again, this is early in their ministry, notice what Christ says in verses 16 to 20. In verses 16 to 20 of the same book and chapter, Matthew 10, the Bible says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpent and harmless as doves, but beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their what? In their synagogue. That means Jesus began to give warnings that while I'm calling you to go minister in the church, there will be those who are in the church who will be your enemy. There are those who will be in the church who will not be for the truth. There will be those that write in the synagogue. They will scourge you and they will punish you. He goes on to say in verse 18, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the spirit of your father which speaketh in you. It was a solemn thing for Christ to see that as much as we are raised up to be family, not everyone's going to be family. This is, the, this is a very sad reality, is that while we are raised up to work together, to be the highest demonstration of brotherly love and unity and Christ-likeness, so that we can give the light, Christ says, I am sorry to tell you that I need to give you a reality check. Not all of your brethren are going to be brethren. Some of them will attack you. Some of them will scourge you. Some of them will punish you. And, and I want you to think about this. Even Paul, when he was getting ready to leave, he knew that he was getting ready to go to Rome. He knew that a time was going to come that he was not going to make it. And as Paul is getting ready to leave, this is what Paul says. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. In other words, I didn't hold anything back. Continuing, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. I like how though Paul knew that opposition was going to come from within, what does Paul say? Feed the flock. 
He doesn't say leave the flock. He doesn't say go start up new flocks. He says right there, feed the flock. Continue to teach, continue to minister. But he says, but I want you to do it not with just a right eye open. I want your left eye open too. And notice what he continues to say. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. He says also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. He says, therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. It broke his heart. It should break anybody's heart. Because it's all right to a degree to get hurt, to be wounded or to find sometimes some type of connection where things are negatively impacting us. That's expected outside. That's expected outside, but that's not expected inside. But the Bible says it is a reality. The reality is that not all who say they are of Israel are Israel. And God says, and I need my people to have their eyes open. You see, God knew that there were some things that were going to take place. Go to the book of Ezekiel chapter eight. What we're going to see right now are prophecies that God put in his word, prophecies. But these prophecies were going to have a fulfillment in the time that it was mentioned, but it was also going to have a last day application, similar to what we talked about in Matthew 24. Now, I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 8. In Ezekiel chapter 8, here's what the Bible shows, and it's a very solemn thing to imagine. In Ezekiel, the eighth chapter, when you get there, just say Amen. Look at Ezekiel 8. Let's look at verses 9 and 10. Ezekiel 8, verses 9 and 10. Unfortunately, in the very temple, in the very temple of God, there were abominations that were being practiced. This ought not be, right? We would think to ourselves, no, no, never. But God says, nope, this is a reality, that these things would start taking place. And I want you to see it in Ezekiel 8. Look at verses 9 and 10. It says in Ezekiel 8, verse 9, And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. Idolatry was being practiced by the people who believed and professed present truth. They were worshiping idols. They were allowing unclean things to come into the temple, and no unclean thing was supposed to go into the temple. That would defile it. Then when you look at verse 12, it says in verse 12, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chamber of his imagery, for they say the Lord sees us not. So they would have an attitude that, Well, it's not like God really sees what's going on. So they would continue these things that were referred to as abominations. In verse 14, it says, Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Tammuz was a pagan god. But again, this is happening in the house of God. Then you look at verse 16. It says, and he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they worshiped the sun toward the east. The last abomination that happened in the day that Ezekiel gave this prophecy was the people of God, the ancients of God, even the teachers of righteousness, were now practicing sun worship. And while that was fulfilled in type, it's going to have a larger fulfillment in anti-type. Many individuals who, unfortunately, though the appeals were abundant, though Christ was wooing and pleading with their hearts, they refused to listen. And as a result of that, they found themselves at complete opposition of God. God actually says, amongst my own people in the last days, they will be practicing abominations. Not only that, but in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, the Bible also says the sins of Israel of old will be repeated. In 
Revelation 3, 14 through 17, self-righteousness will take possession of many hearts. They will begin to look to their schooling. They will look to their degrees and they will look to all of their accolades and say, why should I listen to you when you're an ignorant fisherman? Why is it that I should listen? I already know the word of God. I don't need you to teach me anything. There will be attitudes of individuals that will show that they think more of themselves than they should. God said, this is going to happen amongst my own people. Not only that, God's love, agape love, agape love will disappear from many hearts because of the rise of sin. God says, this is going to happen amongst my own. I remember I was doing a study. I remember I was doing a study. I had this couple, Carlos and Lissandra. And I remember that I was studying with them over and over again. They were not at Venice. And I would show them all of the proofs that we are God's last day movement of Bible prophecy. I'd show them all of it, right? Never forget this. It really opened my eyes to a lot. Uh, Carlos said, I'm in. He said, I believe these things. I, I accept these things. This is truth. I said, Lissandra, what is, it, what is your desire? She said, I can't yet, Brother Lemon. I said, really? I said, is there any questions that you have? <sighs> There's just something wrong, but I can't put my hands on it. And so week after week would go by, and I'd keep studying with Lissandra and keep sharing. And then Lissandra still would just say, I, I, just, I just don't know what it is. I just can't accept the appeal to go all the way with baptism. So one night, I'm driving, and I'm praying, and I'm saying, Lord, what is it that's holding Lissandra back? And God said to my heart, show them the realities of what my people will go through in the last days. And I remember thinking to myself, no. I'm like, Lord, if I show somebody the realities of what's going to happen amongst your own people, that would turn them away. God says, no, that will give them the reality of what they're joining. So I obeyed. I said, all right. I said, Lissandra, Carlos, I got something to show you. Let's go. And I walked them through Bible prophecy. I showed them all of this. And I showed them what I'm about to show you to close it out. I lied to you not. When I was done with the message, Lysandra said, Brother Lemon. I said, yes. She said, I'm ready to be baptized. I said, tell me why. She said, Brother Lemon, I'm not blind. I see the problems that are going on in your churches. I see the trials. I see the tribulations. And I see the inconsistency and the hypocrisies. And she said, and it seemed like everybody wanted to cover it up and just make it seem like it's just not there. And I wanted to see, does anybody see what I see? And she said, and tonight you showed me, you see what I see, and you gave me an option. I can join God's church and be part of the problem, or I can join God's church and be part of the solution. She says, I have decided to join the church and I will be part of the solution. Do you know it's 10 years later and I just communicated with them several months ago, still in the church, still going strong. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't make any sense to lie to anybody. Amen. God's church is a hospital filled with more sick than healthy. And that sickness is manifested in many different ways through our characters. And some of us have serious character defects, short tempers, some of us are very indulgent. Some of us are very pliable. One minute, yeah, 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 I agree with you. And next minute, uh, yeah, 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 I agree with you. They don't have any foundation, no strong standard. So many challenges. And people are neither deaf, dumb, or blind. And they see it, but God saw it. You see, this is what God said. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And what did he promise? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know what that tells me? God is going to have a victorious church. The church is going to go through trial. The church is going to go through tribulation. The church is going to go through all sorts of problems and drama. And what God is doing is just like in an army. He is raising up soldiers to say, will you be part of the problem or are you going to be part of the solution? Now, 
If we choose to be part of the solution, that means that we got to leave darkness and walk in his word. That means we got to leave darkness and harmonize our lives with his law. That means we got to leave darkness and start saying, I need to choose to follow Jesus and reflect him. If we're going to be part of the solution, this is what the Lord is doing right now. He's enlisting. Now, I'm sad to tell you, there are some people that Satan sends into the church. If you don't believe it, go back to Matthew 13, read the parable of the wheat and tares. The Bible says that the tares were planted by Satan. When the people said, where did these tares come from? The Bible answered, an enemy did this. There are some people that's not here for the truth. And I'm not talking about this room right here. I'm just talking about the church. There are some people that's not, they're not in the church for the truth. They're not here to learn how to be sanctified. Some of them are looking for some girl that they can go get with. Some of them are looking for some guy that they can get with. All they got is women and men on their minds.
they would lose some of the grain because it was just so closely connected to the chapters. And the farmer's okay because he got the majority of the grain. But look at the loving care of your heavenly father. God says, shall not the least grain fall. God says, I will not forget my people. We are told, beloved, Satan will work his miracles to deceive. He will set up his power as supreme. The church may appear as about to fall, but it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion will be sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious people. This is a terrible ordeal, but nevertheless, it must take place. None but those who have been overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony will be found with the loyal and true, without spot or stain of sin, without guile in their mouths. The remnant that purify their souls by obeying the truth gather strength from the trying process, exhibiting the beauty of holiness amid the surrounding apostasy. God says, I'm going to have a people. Amen. You see the prophetic picture? Satan loves to counterfeit what God does. God sets up faithful souls. Satan says, I'll set up unfaithful souls. Then after that, God sets up a chosen nation. Satan says, no problem, I'll set up a rebellious nation. Mm -hmm. Then after that, God says, I'll set up a Christian church. Satan says, no problem, I'll set up the apostate church. Mm -hmm. Then after that, God sets up the remnant church. Satan says, I will fight it with Babylon. Yeah. So at no point in our journey from earth to heaven, beloved, are we going to be without fight. Yeah. And so if you're not a man or sister of war, you better learn how to be one. You want to learn how to fight and contend, as Jude says, contend for the faith that has once been delivered unto the saints. Amen. Amen. And so we're in a war. We didn't ask to be in it. God's church is going to win. God's church will not fall. The sinners and Zion will be sifted out when you and I decide who's chaff and who's weak as we cooperate with the light. And Christ says, I am the light, and I want you to walk in the light as I'm in it. And beloved, I'm just telling you the truth. The great purpose of God's church is to give forth that light, but God makes it clear in our study today, it is not going to be without fire. We're going to have to know how to stand though the heavens may fall. We must choose to say, I choose to be on the Lord's side rather than on the enemy's side. And there are going to be two sides. And you and I, every single day, and next week we're going to do part two. Next week we're going to talk about the four ways to avoid being shaken up. Amen. Because God's going to be shaken right now. Mm -hmm. Next Sabbath, we're going to study what are the four ways that God protects us from being shaken out. Mm. And so my hope and prayer is that every single one of us will be there, ready to learn. Lord, show me how to stand, not be shaken out, but to stand firm. Though the heavens may fall. For I read a little statement that says, the greatest want of the world Amen. is the want of men. Men who will not be born a soul. Men who in their inmost souls are true and honest. Men whose consciences are as true to duty as the needle to the pole. Men who do not fear to call sin by its right name. Men who will stand for the right, though the heavens fall. I want to be such a man, but guess what? I can't do it without Jesus. Amen. You can't either. I am sorry to inform you, beloved, but we are in a war. The great controversy started in heaven, but it continues on this earth, and it's going to keep going until the close of probation. You and I need to make a decision because it's too late to say, I don't want to fight. It's too late for that. You're in the fight. You only have one choice, lose or win. Mm -hmm. so my hope and prayer is that I will choose to say, I choose to win. And I hope you choose to win. And so if you choose to win, then my question is, will you stand to your feet to testify to that fact? If you say, Lord, I want to be on your side. I choose to win. I want to be part of the solution. By your grace, not part of the problem. That's why you stand. I will be part of the solution, and not part of the problem. That's the only reason you stand. Because you say, Lord, by your grace, I'll be part of the solution. Mr. Family, I want you to know it. Jesus loves us with an everlasting love. And my hope is praise that you will be found for you, even unto death. For it is then and only then that you will receive your crown of righteousness. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much 
for the blessing that you've given to us, your people. We thank you, dear God, for just showing us that we are living in a reality of truly a great controversy. And while there are many who may not stand for you, Lord, there are some who are choosing to say, Lord, let your will be done in my heart. I pray for every precious soul who took your stand. I pray that you might give them courage, to give them strength, to give them balance from your words, to know what to do, when to do, and how to do, according to thy will. Lord, if there's any who have not stand, continue to prick the heart, Father, and I pray that you might help them to see that you're calling for all of us to stand in these last days. May they stand before these two days. Keep us faithful, Lord. Thank you for hearing our prayer. But we ask it all in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. 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 Amen.